Well, hello and welcome to another edition of the Bill of Rights Institute's Primary Source Close Reads. We're really glad you're joining us. Uh, my name is Kirk Higgins, and for those of you who are new to our Close Read format, every other Thursday we work through a significant primary source from American history, um, looking for important ideas and themes um, and discussing those. Uh, and this week we have an important document from 20th century American foreign policy uh, called The Sources of Soviet Conduct by Mr. X, uh, who was later revealed to be George Kennan. Uh, to help me unpack this document, I am fortunate to be joined once again by my colleague, Tony Williams. Tony, thanks for joining me. Hi, Kirk. Sure. Uh, and a great document and a, a great topic of, of the Cold War. So really excited. Absolutely. Well, let's dive in. So Sources of Soviet Conduct was published in July of 1947. Uh, and I think you know, this, this period, you know, I mentioned at the beginning, it's a part of American foreign policy, but this period between 1945 and 1950, call it, sees an incredible change. Um, and so I, I want us to explore the article kind of with that in mind, um, because I think that's often how, how it comes up in context. I think often it's also just referred to as the Mr. X article, which is also really interesting to me. Um, and so as we're going through, I hope we can also keep an eye out for how George Kennan is articulating this need for change, particularly in 1947. Uh, because I think it's it, seeing the document, I mean, seeing any document in its context, I think is incredibly important. Um, but when you think about it, this one in, in terms of it's 1947, we don't know what's going to happen in 1948 or 1949 or 1989 for that matter. Um, I think it becomes really interesting. So we'll come back to these questions at the end, uh, but I just wanted to lay them out for us, Tony. Um, so speaking of that historical context, George Kennan writes this article. Um, and it comes after the Yalta Conference in 1945, which is important, after the founding of the United Nations, um, and is written by this gentleman, George Kennan, who was Deputy Chief of Mission um, of the United States to the Soviet Union between 1944 and 1946. So, Tony, can you, can you set the stage? What's, what's going on in this period? Why is Kennan writing this article, and, and what what about the end of the Second World War should we should we know in order to, to really understand um, this particular piece? Right. Well, there, there's a lot going on, but uh, we'll, we'll um, you know, dial into the, some of the most important events. So, you know, Russia and the United States are, are closing in uh, on Germany uh, and even crossing the borders into Germany. Uh, Germany's defeat is somewhat of a foregone conclusion at this point, and the, the Allies do meet at Yalta to try to hammer out some of their visions of, of what the post-war world is going to look like and, and try to come to some sort of agreement. The Russians agree to provide free elections in Poland, sort of free governments in, in Eastern Europe. Uh, but of course, they'll break those uh, very quickly as they establish their sort of unilateral domination over those areas. Um, you know, a few months later, as the war is really winding down and coming to an end in early May, uh, we have uh, the major powers meeting at, in San Francisco to establish the United Nations. But even there, there's some tensions about who's going to control the Security Council and how many votes they're going to have, and and several other issues uh, come up. So, so even as they're you know, solving some of the post-war issues or or attempting to, uh, there's increasing conflict between the the Soviets and the West, uh, specifically in the United States and and also Great Britain and, and France, uh, and. George Kennan uh, is in is in uh, the Soviet Union as as a diplomat, as someone who's in the Foreign Service, and and he's sort of seeing uh, you know the formulation of, of Soviet policy and trying to understand the psychology, if you will, of why they are uh, you know pursuing the policies that they are. Great, and so I think understanding is a really interesting way to, to frame this at the beginning. Um, and so I, I like when we look at these primary sources, I really love to look at the beginning of them, uh, but I also like looking at the title. And of course the author is always important. So we have this title, Sources of Soviet Conduct, um, which isn't, I mean, it's not jumping off the page, right? Um, but it's interesting. I think 
I think that title is important for what he does in this piece. Um, and, and in particular, you know, even this, this opening paragraph is that, I mean, th th do you agree, Tony, that like, he's really setting up, I mean, it's, it's pretty cut and dry what he's wanting to talk about here. Right. He's really, as you see, he says it's the Soviet power and, and the policies they're pursuing around the globe are rooted in the product of their ideology. In other words, their communist Soviet ideology and their circumstances. So what historical circumstances have led to this, especially under the czarist regimes, you know, Kennan takes a very, very long uh, view over several centuries, but also then dials in on the actual Marxist Leninist philosophy and then how those trends are and, and, and viewpoints are shaping Soviet foreign policy and Soviet conduct. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting to me that, it, again, taking off our presentism hat, reading this paragraph now is like, yeah, okay, you know, we know this about the Soviet Union, but in 1947, that would have been, not that it was unknown, but I think stating it this frankly, and as a direct cause of the way that the Soviet Union is going to make decisions on the foreign stage um, was significant. Um, and I think looking at it from that perspective is, is important. But, you know, it does strike me, though, because it does seem pretty inane. Um, why disguise your name as Mr. X? What is it that, that George Kennan might have been concerned about? Well, uh, I think uh, twofold. One is he got in a little trouble with uh, General George Marshall uh, on uh, criticizing the administration uh, earlier. But he also, I think more importantly, uh, wanted to be anonymous because he wanted the ideas to speak for themselves. He didn't want his own personality, a uh, reputation wrapped up in the ideas. He, he wanted to influence American policymakers through this article, through this idea, and really shape the, the thinking of the, the Truman administration and, and how to approach the Soviet Union diplomatically. Great. So he, he sets out, again, what how he's going to address those ideas. Um, and he says, there can be few tasks of psychological analysis more difficult than to trace the interaction of these two forces uh, in the relative role of each in the determination of official Soviet conduct. Yet the attempt must be made if that conduct is to be understood and effectively countered. So it sounds like he's going to psychoanalyze uh, the Soviet Union to try to determine how it is that we should should deal with them. And he launches right into that, I think, right away in this sort of long but very detailed uh, summary of Soviet style um, governing and um, economic outlook, which I found really interesting. Right. Now, you know, one of the things you don't see is, is quite like the, the character of the, the czarist regime that had existed for hundreds of years. And, and the czarist regime and the Soviet regime were really close societies in many ways and, and not really readily understood in the West. And so he's really trying to educate as long as provide policy prescriptions. And here you, you basically see him talking about it, it's a communist society. It's rooted in violent uh, revolution, uh, overthrow of capitalism, uh, and that um, you know because of the the historical circumstances, and also because of their experience as as a Soviet state since 1917, you know they sort of felt beleaguered uh, by the West uh, and and wanted to prove themselves. That's kind of the psychological factor here. And re, you know he sees the Soviets as expecting the eventual collapse of what you know capitalism and what you know what he under what the russians understand as russian uh, i'm sorry western imperialism and says that this this marxist leninist viewpoint of capitalism they are going to work to achieve that consistently and constantly in their conduct and one needs to understand how antagonistic to the west that fundamentally this regime is, and, and it'll constantly work to, to, to defeat the West. Yeah, I think what I see are a couple themes that Kennan really builds on and works throughout this entire article. One is the Soviets are true believers in their ideology, mm -hmm. um, that that ideology drives 
the decisions that they make uh, both domestically and on the foreign stage um, that the the main enemy within their ideology is a capitalist system um, and that they believe that over time that capitalist system is going to destroy itself and eventually collapse um, and I think it's on those things that that Kennan begins to formulate um, his argument for how it is that the United States should respond so given given those, elements, right? The belief, um, the idea that, that, that the Soviet Union is, you know, very much poised against um, capitalist systems and that they're going to defeat themselves. Um, he then articulates his vision, but sort of like the final thing to underscore that he says, okay, so here are the things that they believe. And then he uses Lenin's own words to say, and this is what they mean by that. So their beliefs on the one hand, academically, we can understand that, but there's a consequence to that. Um, and that's where he, you know, starts talking about that the Soviet Union is very interested in in pushing Western empires to reach that final stage um, of of revolution, revolutionary proletariat movement, right? That to to overthrow themselves and eventually collapse. Right, and and you know the interesting thing here, just generally thinking about diplomacy, is all all nation states act according to their own self interests. Of course, uh, the United States uh, has and and does and will. But what he's saying is that they're going to act according to their self-interest, guided by this Marxist-Leninist, by this communist ideology. And that, that's really central. He keeps that, as, as you see in all these different slides, keeps that center. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and it's interesting, too, that it's center now. So again, we're talking about that change between 1945 and 1950. Mm -hmm. um, and it, earlier, he had mentioned, you know, the Soviet revolution in Russia takes place in 1917. Um, the Soviet regime is established after that. They've been in power through the 20s and 30s and 40s. Um, and yet now he's he's concerned about it, right? And he, he mentions here kind of why it is that this is a problem immediately, which I found really interesting too. Right. And, and, and the Russians feel insecure, right? And he talks about that under the czarist regime and, and uh, under the communist regime as well. And in, in many ways, uh, you know, right after the war, you could understand that, right? They had been invaded by Germany twice uh, over uh, what a 30 year period or so uh, and had suffered great destruction during World War II. I mean, they had lost uh, 25 million soldiers uh, and, and civilians. Uh, it was just incredible, the, the, the amount of death and destruction uh, in Russia, particularly in, in the western part of Russia, and that you know Russia was saying no more, right? No more are we going to deal with this, you know, not only just imperialism but also these these invasions. Yeah, and I think he sums it up well when he says, "For ideology, as we have seen, taught them that the outside world was hostile, and that there is it was their duty, eventually, to overthrow the political forces beyond their borders." Um, you know, I think that, that, be, so later when, you know, when we're looking at the Cold War, we're hearing these terms, the Iron Curtain, everything else. I think Kennan is, if not predicting that, he's at least saying, look, it is a closed society and it's closed because of a reason you can sort of discern, um, which again, 1947, we don't know what's going to happen, mm -hmm. um, but it's interesting that, that Kennan is picking up on, on these themes. So again, after setting up that, you know, the, the, the seriousness with, with which they um, take their ideology, he kind of comes down on that again and says, you know, they're, they're going to take this seriously. And because they believe that this outside world is dangerous and because they see capitalism as being antagonistic to their interests and because they are this closed society, they are going to position themselves so that they are, are constantly working toward the attainment of the ends of society that they think are most important. Um, and it seems to me that that's the, the crux on which the rest of this article lands. So again, the ideology is serious. They take it seriously. Um, he says here that, uh, that it's a sincere assumption of a community of aims, right? It's, they, they mean what they say um, and that all of their tactical decisions on a foreign policy level are serving their own self-interest, as you said earlier, their own self-interest seen through this lens. 
Yeah, I mean, a, a really important quote there down at the bottom where he says, and it may flow uh, many of the phenomena which we find disturbing in the Kremlin's conduct of foreign policy, the secretiveness, the lack of frankness, the, the duplicity, the wary suspiciousness, and the basic unfriendliness of purpose, right? He's basically saying you can't trust the Russians, right? They may make agreements. Uh, they may seem like they have some peaceful intentions in places. They may disclaim that they're intervening somewhere or, or in trying to influence the situation. But he says you can never trust them. Uh, they're, they're too duplicitous. And, and, and they were, you know, think about the context, right? They, they were expanding into Iran uh, with troops. Uh, they were uh, threatening Turkey. Uh, they were uh, pushing communism in Greece uh, during a civil war. Uh, they were influencing elections in, in Italy and France. Uh, they were establishing totalitarian control in Poland and throughout much of Eastern Europe. Uh, they were making threatening overtures in, in Asia as well. Uh, within a few years, we'll have you know the, the Korean War erupt. Uh, you know, so so Kennan's writing in a world where these are not just abstract thoughts, but he's looking at their actual actions over the previous couple of years, and he's seeing that they uh, are threatening the world um, and expanding their influence. And he really stresses that duplicitousness, right, and in the concern over it because. I think, and again, this, I think it's important to keep in mind too, I'm sure that there were continued concerns about the appeasement that had taken place um, in Europe um, in the 1930s. Um, I know that Winston Churchill had given a speech in 1946 uh, decrying, um, you know, the Iron Curtain that's falling over Europe, right? So this is something being talked about in other sectors, um, but people, it's only two years after the Second World War, which was a, a, a worldwide catastrophe. Um, you can see where people are going to fall on both sides of this issue. And I think it's interesting that Kennan, after making that statement, again, showing, look, this is their ideology. They believe in it. This is what it means. Um, he then makes this argument to say, they're always going to be duplicitous because that's the thing they're ultimately serving, regardless of what they tell you. Um, and then goes on to say, and, and maybe this gets at some of the end of an interview, look, there's going to be people that are coming forward and defending these actions because they think that the Soviets are sincere. And I'm here to argue, George Kennan, uh, or Mr. X, I guess, in this case, don't trust them because they're, they're, they're going to follow this ideology. It's what they believe in. They're sincere about it. And we need to have our eyes wide open to the fact that that is the primary interest that they're going to, to serve. Right, and, and you know, the lines harden, right? Uh, and, and Henry Wallace, who's the Secretary of the Commerce, he's, he's uh, more liberal and uh, left-leaning and, and says some, some sympathetic things about communism, and uh, he's fired uh, by, by President Truman uh, and, and other Western intellectuals um, and, and politicians are sympathetic to the Russians, and, and they make these arguments that, that, that they suffered a great deal in World War II, um, but they're also, you know, somewhat sympathetic to, you know, communism. Uh, and uh, you know, we start, start to see some of those dividing lines in America, though, right, uh, as sort of uh, this Cold War mentality eventually takes hold and, and McCarthyism comes around only a few years later. Um, you know, people in, in America aren't going to tolerate that, that kind of support in, in that environment and, and that kind of atmosphere um where where russia's the enemy yeah and it's interesting like you said Dick, this is this is an example it's not the only example but this article is such a seminal piece because it is an example of seeing those lines harden uh it is it is someone who is established in the foreign policy apparatus of the united states government giving their honest opinion about what they're reading insofar as what the Soviet Union believes uh, and ultimately what that's going to mean and why that sows a seed of distrust when they had been an ally, an essential ally in winning the Second World War. I mean, I think it's, you know, without the Soviet Union involved on that conflict on the side of the allies, that's a very different, it's a very different conflict. Um, and so he goes on to, to really nail this down and he begins to articulate what that then means for the United States. 
um, which I think is is really interesting. So again, he's summarizing how it is that they're looking at this theory, what that's going to mean, um, and and yet it's not an immediate threat. He's kind of like, hey, be concerned about this, but just know this is going to be around for a while, which again, I think is one of these prescient things that people come back to this article time and time again, um, because he says, and I love this line, the forces of progress can take their time in preparing the final coup de grace. Uh, and, you know, it's sort of this, look, the Soviets think that we're going to collapse, you know, us, you know, capitalist free market nations, democratic governments. Um, and so they're, they're not in a hurry to get rid of us, but they do want to sort of advance their ideology um, and put us in a position to make that happen as quickly as possible to meet that worldview. But don't panic, just understand, that's how I'm reading it anyway. Ken is just saying, look, understand, this is just the way it is um, and, and we should get used to it. Right, and, and I think on, on this and, and the next slide, um, you know, you, you see that he's already spoken about the sources of Soviet conduct, and now he's going to provide because he's, you know, he's a diplomat, he's, he's a policymaker, he wants to provide some prescriptive uh, course to follow uh, for the United States, and that policy is going to be known throughout the Cold War uh, for, for decades as containment. Right, and and there's a there's a lot of controversy uh, with Kennan because uh, he believed in many ways, as we'll see in the source, that in you know, this containment should be political, uh, it should be diplomatic, uh, it can be economic, um, occasionally it can be military, uh, but he didn't mean for it to be primarily military, right? And and he later, uh, of course, we don't know this at this point, but he later sort of became despondent that the various administrations had taken his containment idea and used it for sort of what he considered military adventurism around the globe, you know, intervening, intervening in Korea, intervening in Vietnam, getting involved in the wars in Africa and the Middle East and, uh, you know, in Latin America, sort of throughout the world, uh, and in joining NATO in Europe. Uh, he didn't really support much of that. Uh, later on throughout the decades, and he lived a very long life. I think he was over 100 when he died. Uh, and so he saw all of this occur, and, and he was really um, dismayed uh, that his ideas of more of a political and diplomatic containment became militarized. Yeah, and you had mentioned containment, and I think that is the, the very next um, slide here that he starts to go into. And I think this is this is often, I think, the lesson that that comes away, but I kind of want to, I, I, I want to push on that too, because I think there's actually, I think Kennan has two themes that are interwoven here that he thinks are important that the United States does, but one is, um, and he says, you know, in these circumstances, it is clear that the mean element of any United States policy toward the Soviet Union, meaning our average stance, must be that of a long-term patient, but firm and vigilant containment of Russia, Russian expansive tendencies, right? So reading that, you know, again, looking backwards, we said as well, yeah, it looks like that's what we did. We went to Vietnam, we went to Korea, we went to, you know, all of these other places around the globe, um, trying to push back against communism. Um, but yeah, it's interesting to hear you say, Tony, that that's not, that's not quite the way that he was framing it. Um, and, it, you know, he goes, yeah, go ahead. But he's vague, right? I mean, yeah. he's not a long-term patient, but firm and vigilant. Well, well, what does that mean, right? The, the prudential sort of politician needs to apply those in certain situations, you know. Can a firm and vigilant containment include intervening in the Korean War? Can it mean sending troops to Vietnam? Uh, you know, he's, he's, he's vague, right? And, and he's just laying out a vision, right? Not a specific policy per se. Uh, and so it's probably not a surprise that various administrations will see their actions in, as firm and vigilant, and, and that can include going to war. Yeah, and he says, you know, um, that uh, they can be contained by the adroit and vigilant application of counterforce, right? What is counterforce? Um, at a series of constantly shifting geographical and political points corresponding to the shifts and maneuvers of Soviet policy, but which cannot be charmed or talked out of existence, right? And again, thinking about context of appeasement, um, I mean, it sounds like it sounds like he's against appeasing the Soviet Union. It sounds like he's saying, hey, 
you know, we, we need to counter this wherever it comes up. And it doesn't seem like they can be charmed or talked out of, which to me sounds like foreign policy. But, but it's interesting that it's not, that is not, you know, like you said later, he, he says it's not quite what I, what I meant or what I intended, um, which is really interesting. But, but again, you know, he doesn't define the geographical points, right? He says they're shifting. And of course, he doesn't just say we only need to do this in Europe, for example, or only do it in Asia. I mean, if they're shifting, that, that again, that's vague. And it provides a, a lot of latitude for people who embrace this rejection of appeasement and embrace containment to follow the policies uh, of their respective administrations. And I think it's interesting that, you know, he comes off that containment. But again, he comes back to what seems to me that the central point of his article, so it's good, it's called Source of Soviet Conduct. It's not what to do about Soviet conduct or what the world is going to look like in several years or whatever. Sources of Soviet Conduct seems to me, if that's his title, I've got to assume that's a deliberate choice. There's got to be something that he's pointing to here. And he comes back to, there's that the sources, the ideology, the seriousness with which they take it. And because of that, this paragraph becomes incredibly important to me because he says, look, for the foreseeable future, um, it, we cannot expect that we're going to have political intimacy with the Soviet regime. Um, the United States must continue to regard the Soviet Union as a rival, not a partner in the political arena. It must continue to expect that Soviet policies will reflect no abstract love of peace and stability, no real faith in the possibility of a permanent happy coexistence of the socialist and capitalist worlds, but rather a cautious, persistent pressure toward the disruption and weakening of all rival influence and rival power. Um, so again, we know their ideology, we see how they've been acting, even though he doesn't go into those details, it's sort of assumed, and this is the way things are gonna be. So we need to contain that. Like we said, that containment word is, is complicated, um, but we need, to be, we, need to be open, we need to be understanding of that. I think to me seems to be the, the central thrust of his policy argument here. They're a rival, they're an enemy, they're an opponent. <laughs> they need to be resisted. Uh, you know, he says no peaceful coexistence, uh, no, no detente, no, no decreasing of tensions. They are out to basically, you know, dominate the world or pursue their self-interest in every way possible. And, you know, it's gonna be up to the United States to contain that expansion. And, and yet, What's interesting to me is that he doesn't stop there. And this was, you know, when I re rereading this again, it's been a while since I picked up this document, but rereading this in preparation for our conversation, it's interesting that containment is one piece of it, but there's this other piece that is important, which is sort of the alternative narrative, right? I think that's probably what we call it today. Um, but it's, it's this idea that, you know, look, the Soviet Union is pushing their ideology. We've got to be willing to stand up for our own ideology should we oppose the Soviet view of the world. So containing it, having that passive stance of just saying like, no, that's not right. Um, or, or no, there's not a lot of hope and freedom there. Doesn't, isn't, isn't the only way that this needs to be pushed back against, but there's actually a positive element here too, of saying, look, this, the, the, I don't know that, you know, he directly says that it's a capitalist world, but like that, that this idea that there's, there's something to, free societies, open societies, democratic societies that need to be advocated for. Otherwise, we're already in a losing position by not having another side of this story. Right. I, I mean, I couldn't have said it better. I mean, he's promoting uh, the best way to defeat Soviet communism is to be a free society with democratic forms of government and, and prosperous capitalist free market economies and, and give people the freedom to uh, pursue their own happiness and, and live their lives. Yeah, and I love, there's several great lines in here, but um, he says, uh, uh, where is it? Which has a spiritual vitality capable of holding its own among the major ideological currents of the time. To the extent that such an impression can be created and maintained, the aims of Russian communism must appear sterile and quixotic. The hopes and enthusiasm of Moscow's supporters must wane and added strain must be imposed on the Kremlin's foreign policies. Um, for the palisade decrepitude of the capitalist world is the keystone of communist philosophy. So, you know, look, if we can show ourselves to be, a, to be offering an alternative that offers hope and possibility and prosperity, then that is gonna be the key thing that defeats Soviet ideology, which again, 
interesting too, if we take a step back and we think about foreign policy in the 20th century, this is a different kind of thing than would have happened in the 19th century, right? It's not about geographic territory. It's not about what would have been the 18th century, which is sort of glory for the nation or the monarch. It's about ideology and winning ideological battles is a war of words. It's a war of ideas in a lot of ways. It doesn't take place in the battlefield, the traditional battlefield that, that we've seen in the past. Um, and I think his, his pointing that out and again, sources of Soviet conduct, it's ideology. What's important about that ideology is that it's contained in the ways that it can be contained and that we are offering another ideology that is counter to the one that seems to be opposed to our interests and the interests of those in the world that we support. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great summary. And I think that that's his conclusion here too. Um, surely there was never a fairer test of national quality than this. In the light of circumstance, the thoughtful observer of Russian-American relations will find no cause for complaint in the Kremlin's challenge to American society. He will rather experience a certain gratitude to a providence which, by the American people with this implacable challenge, has made their entire security as a nation dependent on their pulling themselves together and accepting the responsibilities of moral and political leadership that history plainly intended them to bear. So that's both an extraordinarily American statement to me, um, but also one that is is really hitting home on this idea that ideology, you know, the, the way to counter growing communist influence and things around the world is to double down on our ideology. And by the way, the success of that ideology, all we have to do is have the success that we believe that we're destined to have in essence, which I think is, is really powerful and, and really insightful. I mean, it's a statement of American exceptionalism, as as uh, the, the term goes, and he's also, uh, you know, pushing America to accept responsibilities of moral and political leadership, as he says, a history plainly intended them to bear. Well, not necessarily, right? I mean, they could have gone either way, and and before World War II, there was there was a great deal of isolationism and and a desire not to get involved in in world and especially European affairs, especially after World War One. And uh, now we have a second world war and rather than retreat to that isolationism again uh, from an even more destructive war, uh, you know, Kennan is pushing Americans towards accepting a more expansive vision of their global responsibilities and, and a more expansive uh, foreign policy. Yeah, and so Again, thinking about these questions, I think I think we touched on them pretty good, though. I mean, that, that change between 1945 and 1950 is, in a way, America stepping into that role. Whatever its justification may be, it steps forward and sort of becomes this, it, or it, it at least begins to see itself as an important piece of combating that alternative ideology. Um, it is that drive that begins to get it involved in different foreign conflicts around the world. Um, that obviously has roots further back in American history in the way that we talked about imperialism in the 1890s, Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. I mean, there's there's lots of stages, but this is sort of the, the time that it emerges um, and gets pointed towards a distinct enemy. Um, and then to that point, that's kind of the second question, right? That's what George Kennan is articulating here. Um, it's that idea of containment, right? So tactically, a way of thinking about it, I think it becomes famous for that. But But even more than that, it's this it's the importance of America having, or the United States having that that position on the world stage and, and sort of what it begins to, at least from Kennan's point of view, how it ought to justify taking that stance in all of its foreign policy decisions. Right, and, and I, I think that's absolutely right. And, and, and my concluding thought might be to offer that, you know, I think Kennan's sort of even moral vision, uh, his ideological vision uh, of the world really is borne out right by history uh, and with the benefit of hindsight looking at the long history of the Cold War and, and the eventual demise of the Soviet Union and its its control over Eastern Europe, we see uh, that that the, the vision of sort of free and democratic societies around the world uh, was you know was better uh, than than the communist alternative uh, that the Soviets had to offer. 
Well, thank you, Tony, again, for joining me. This was a lot of fun picking apart uh, this article. Um, and to all of you watching, um, thank you for joining us again. If you like this video, please be sure to subscribe to our channel. Um, as I mentioned, we put out new videos every Tuesday and Thursday on all things U.S. history and civics, uh, including close reads of primary sources, um, but also interviews. Um, we have distinguished scholars on. Tony speaks to many of them. Um, and we also produce homework help videos um, specifically for geared towards students and use in classrooms. Um, our next primary source close read uh, will come out on April 8th, and I'll be discussing the Port Huron statement, which should be really interesting. Um, so please join our conversation on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram um, for updates on all of these programs and also all of the professional development programs and curricular projects that we have going on here at the Bill of Rights Institute. Um, and finally, we'd love to hear from you. So please reach out. If there's any topic that you'd like to see us cover, let us know. Um, and we also always love to see your comments. So thank you again for joining us. Tony, thank you. Thank you, Kirk. Pleasure. And we'll see everybody next time.